welcome to 10,000 Africans podcast. My name is JD Tarbett and I am your humble host. Uh, today gladly is our first day on the Tuna Chicky channel so I just want to say welcome to all you subscribers. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure to like and share this video and if you haven't subscribed yet make sure to hit the subscribe button below. Uh, anyways, without further ado, our guest for today is Lola Akimade Akestrom. She is a Nigerian travel photographer, grew up in the United States, and now lives in Sweden as the editor-in-chief of the Slow Travel Stop. Uh, she has an immense amount of experience, but I especially love what she's doing because she is challenging uh, stereotypes. So I enjoyed this episode. Uh, so here it is. Make sure to subscribe below and if you like uh, the audio uh, form of the podcast make sure to um, subscribe on iTunes, on Spotify, uh, on Google Play and on our website 10,000africans.com. Enjoy. Uh, today on the show I have Lola Akinmade Akestrom. Did I get that right? <laughs> yes, yes, close enough. Well, yes. <laughs> okay, perfect. Yes, so uh, Lola is a, is a travel photographer, which we would all love to be. Um, she is an author, and uh, she, she has made such a big transition, but an amazing one. Uh, and she lives in Sweden, she's Nigerian. Um, and once you get to know her, once you get to find her story, you'll, you'll see why I'm so impressed um, by her and her story. So uh, let's get to it. Welcome to the show, Lola. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Excited to have you on. Um, so I talked about you a little bit, but that, that doesn't even define your story. So, so <laughs> uh, please help us fill in the gap. Uh, um, what's the story and how has it led you to where you are now? Okay, so I'll try and give you the condensed version, but uh, I was born and raised in Nigeria, lived there till I was 15, when I then moved to the U.S. to start college, and uh, I lived in the U.S., uh, started a very technical field, so I was into IT and geography, and worked as a GIS programmer for many, many years, until I moved to Sweden eight years ago. So I kind of moved from a really technical career to this more creative uh, life lifestyle, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. Yeah. That's amazing. I think the question in everybody's mind, and this was one of the first things that hit me, how do I get paid to travel and take pictures? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Well, I, and you know, as with every journey, there's always, you know, kind of the hustle and the struggle along the way. But I think the turning point for me was a while, a long time ago, while I was still working as a programmer, I volunteered with an expedition race, and that expedition race was in Fiji. Mm. And my job was to write stories, take some photographs, and report on this expedition race every day for their website. You know, so we could, so I could say, oh, the you know team from South Africa is now coming out of the jungle, and now they're going to the you know to the. And so doing that, I realized, oh my goodness, I think this might actually be a career where I can travel. Mm. write stories, take photos. And so when I came back, I started researching, figuring out what are ways I could take, you know, to be able to travel mm -hmm. the world as well as get paid for it. And so I started while working as a programmer, freelancing for different publications, you know, including National Geographic Traveler, BBC, just different um, publications. And even that. Even when I started freelancing for them, I didn't even have a portfolio. I was able to pitch an idea. Nah. And, and so, what, so I guess my advice right away is be audacious. Don't care that they're going to reject you because I have, I, have, I have had so many rejections in my life. <laughs> it's, not even, it's not even fair, actually. But, <laughs> but uh, so what I did was I knew that I, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to be published in National Geographic. I wanted to go down this path. And so I just started pitching them stories and ideas. What's the worst that could happen? They just ignore you. But what's the best that could happen, right? They actually say yes. Yeah. And so my, so my advice right away is 
try to check your fear and don't worry about rejection. If that's what you want, just go for it because you believe in yourself and you believe in your stories. And so that's kind of what happens. So over time, once you get the first publication, it's easier to get the second and it just kind of builds. Yeah. And so that's, and now, you know, many years later, you know, it's, um, I'm really excited and honored to be able to do what I love, which is um, travel on assignment for different publications, as well as even work with different destinations and campaigns and, and stuff. So, so yeah, yeah excited. I, 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 <laughs> I am, uh, and I, I I don't know, until people search out, they wouldn't get the scope. Um, mm. <laughs> but you say, oh, many years later, but in in truth, it hasn't been that many years because you've done, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, so right now you work, you've worked with like CNNs, BBCs, National Geographic, New York, like everybody, right? Oh, yeah. Everybody who anybody wants to work with. Um, and it's only been uh, an eight-year period. Uh, I'll say I'll say more like ten-year period because before I moved to Sweden, I actually uh, had already started freelancing on the side uh-huh. as a programmer. Okay. So it's my so it's the move to Sweden was when I made the break uh-huh. and said I'm going to do this full time. So so even when I was a programmer, I was actually freelancing on the side, uh-huh. trying to build up my portfolio. Okay. So that it was, so that I had, so that's why I also say, don't quit your day job right away. <laughs> you know, just actually have a plan. Yes. <laughs> so that's what I did is um, made sure I felt like I had enough freelance clients to be able to make the, the switch. Transition over. Oh, okay. And, and then, and then it's also a mental switch because when you make that switch, going from a very stable career in as a programmer which is a, it's also a very financially stable job exactly. to going to freelancing, be ready for that drastic cut in income right away. Yeah. And then, and then it's going to be over time and, and gratefully it's built, you know, back over time, but that initial switch, yeah. you know, <laughs> can definitely you, you, mess you with feel you. the hit. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, oh, wow. So that's, that's, um, it, but ten years is, is a relatively short time in 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 what I understand the, yes. the, the world of photography is. All right. Um, and yes, this, it is. Yeah. And this year well, you. Yeah, I was I was gonna say you were you were awarded photography of the uh, photographer of the year. So congratulations about that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I mean, just to speak to that because um, the award came from the Society of American Travel Writers. And I was awarded the 2018 Travel Photographer of the Year. And it's a very prestigious award. It's a great organization. Congratulations. I think, oh, thank you. But I, I guess in 10, when you look at it as 10 years, it doesn't seem much. But I always say, once you know your strengths mm-hmm. as, a, as an individual, like once you know what you're good at, it's easier to switch industry yeah. and still walk towards your strengths. You know, so if you know you're a, oh, I'm a good, you know, I'm a good team player or I'm a quick study or I am very versatile or I am creative. Once you know kind of what your strengths are, it's easy. It's easier. I'm not saying it's 100% easy, but it's easier to switch. Yeah. And then if you are truly passionate about what you are doing or what you're trying to accomplish, nothing is really going to break your stride. So what happens is if you're not 100% passionate, but then you keep getting rejections and rejections and rejections because they will come Mm -hmm. that that can break your spirit. And then that, you know, might make it longer for you to pursue what you want to do. But if rejections don't break your spirit, but just make you more resilient, you know, or more, or just makes you persevere even more, then you can even increase, (laughs) you know, (laughs) the speed (laughs) at which you want to get to where you want to get. Yeah. So, uh, so, so, yeah. I, you know, even though in the grand scheme of things it feels like a short time, it's been like a daily also. You know, trying to push what you, you know, push. Uh, because I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it because I really love to travel. I really want to to show the world through my eyes as an African. Yes. Because over history, we've always had the single story of 
a travel for photographer has to look like a white guy that's a rugged guy that just came down Everest, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm trying, I, I, you know, I, and that's one of the things I'm trying as an African travel photographer who does this professionally to break that stereotype, to yeah. say that this is not, this industry is not just for you, that it's also for me yeah. and for people that look like me. So, so yeah, that's a part of why I do what I do. Yeah, and I, I think that that's incredible. And my belief has always been uh, the world as we know it is, mm. is it's influenced by media a lot. Yes. And, and media is presented to you in, in terms of the perspective that it comes from. Exactly. Uh, so everything, uh, even build, trying to build a media company, um, for me, the motivation is, you know, having an African perspective in the global discourse. Um, mm-hmm. So for you as a, as a, as a photographer, uh, from an African perspective, what do, you, what, what, what do you think? Do you think that is something that adds to, to, to you as a photographer that makes your work stand out even more and, you know, help get, makes you get awards like this? And on a level, you're also changing people's way to see things. Well, I, I wish it was an advantage, but it actually isn't, you know, right? <laughs> because it means I actually work twice as hard. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell you a story that I think will put this into perspective. And, and I was at a festival once. It was a travel festival. I was sitting with an older lady, a white lady, and we were just talking about what we did. And I told her, oh, you know, I, I've shot you know, articles in, uh, for National Geographic Traveler and stuff, I told her. And her reaction was like, oh, I thought you had to be exceptional to be in National Geographic. Oh, wow. I know. This was a total stranger who had never seen my work wow. before. So just by looking at me, <laughs> she just assumed. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I, because that's the image that media has portrayed of what a travel photographer should look like. Yeah. And if you don't match that image, then people are like, oh, well, then if you can be in it, then then my, you know, my <laughs> selfies can also be in it. Yeah. You know, and so, <laughs> so, so that's what I'm fighting against. And that's why winning this award was also a big statement for me because it wasn't based on, I'm just a, an African travel photographer, but it's actually the quality of my work. And exactly. Most of the time, if you look at my portfolio, uh, you may not know who is behind it, but it is a strong portfolio. That's why I, I get to do the things I do. Yeah. And then it's once you bring me into the picture, they're like, oh, oh, I thought you were a rugged white guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, it's <laughs> so that's one of the things I'm really fighting and pushing and what drives me because I also have a daughter. My, my daughter, she's black, and I want her to fight against any kind of box so yeah. t- society tries to push her to any box that says these are the only places you can play you are not allowed to be in this industry these are your only limitations because i wanted to say well i don't think you've met my mom yet because <laughs> no there is no boundaries to what i can do as a creative that's why i'm doing this it's not just for me yeah. it's for it's to it's to normalize this to normalize oh She's a great fo- travel photographer and writer, and she also happens to be African. Yeah. That's why I'm fighting, and that's why I do what I do. Absolutely. I am impressed. Um, uh, <laughs> so, you know, in terms of your work, in terms of, you know, your position, in terms of everything that you're doing, so amazing. Um, what is the biggest challenge you think you face so far working in business, uh, in, in, in photography, in terms of, you know, helping people who, who, who want to follow that path? All right. Well, I, I think that the biggest uh, challenge, I mean, it, it is a very condensed field, but um, you know, uh, Viola Davis, the actress Viola Davis, yeah. there was something she said that was very just poignant when she won an award. She said, the difference between black women and others is opportunity. Yeah. Right. And so fighting to get the opportunity to show the world that I can do this, or I'm equally as good, or maybe even better has been the challenge. Because, again, it's fighting that stereotype, assuming that, you know, many photo editors, instead of maybe commissioning me, they may commission, you know, 
uh, a guy because it fits the image of what a travel photographer should look like. Yeah. As opposed to commissioning me based on my portfolio. And so that's the challenge is getting those opportunities to prove that I'm, I'm not only good at this, you know, but maybe I might be even better than that guy, you know, that yeah. you're commissioning. So that's one of the challenges. But at the same time, that should also, that should not um, make you, uh, I was going to say, discourage you. Yeah. You can start building your own platforms. That's what I do. I've got my own blog. I've got other platforms as well where you can build your own platforms to share your work and then people can also find you. It attracts the right people to you. Yeah. And that's why I say about rejection. I don't have to spend my whole life chasing a specific publication. I can build my own platform and over time they'll come to me. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, I think uh, uh, Lola is very humble uh, because she is, uh, <laughs> she is an editor in chief uh, of the slow travels talk uh, which yeah. uh, is, has a lot of, uh, of, of uh, visitors and you also recently took over uh, the Sweden national Twitter account. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I so, don't know. Maybe I should call the Guinness Book of Records. I don't know. Maybe that, I, that was like the first time a Nigerian took over Sweden's exactly, official Twitch. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so let's just, yeah. let's just brag about that a little bit. <laughs> uh, well, I think what, what drives me, you know, honestly, as a, even as a travel writer, because I explore culture through food, through tradition, through lifestyle, it's just that innate curiosity. And people always ask me, why do you write about Sweden a lot? Why do you, you know, why do you want to know everything about the culture? I'm like, first of all, I'm married into the culture. Yeah. My kids are half Swedish. I have to know. I, in fact, I better know what <laughs> exactly. that culture is about. <laughs> I better know what I've married into and I better understand how it's going to shape and affect their lives. So yeah. yes, I write a lot about Sweden. I get some be beneath its surface. And, uh, and I think that's what any good travel writer does is wherever you are, yeah. it doesn't have to be far away. It could be in your own backyard. You want to yeah. get beneath the place, learn the stories, see what makes the place flow, what runs through its blood, and just uh, share those stories as well. Yeah. And I, I, think, I think it is important um, what you're doing because as Africans... We are, with, especially with writers, with photographers, with videographers, with content creators, you are expected as an African to report on Africa. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so I love when I see somebody who's African talking about some, like, uh, 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 somewhere like Sweden, right? Because yeah. it is important, I believe, to be part of this global conversation. Um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I think, and I think, not only write about it, or be able to write about it with authority too. Because exactly. I actually went to, uh, I think it was maybe like a conference or a summit. Uh, I think two years ago, where we were talking about African travel writing and African travel writers, and that was actually what I said. I said one of the challenges for me personally has been. I've been doing this for many years, but because I write about other cultures, maybe my voice isn't as seen as authoritative as if I was writing about Nigeria. Yeah. But but I haven't lived in Nigeria since I've been 15, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so so it you know, I go to visit family. I enjoy Nigeria. I love Nigeria. I mean, Lagos is my place, but I can't write about it in a way that I would maybe write about Stockholm just because I don't live there right now. Exactly. I can write about the culture, you know, about some of the social aspects, but but to write about it, it's just different because I don't live there. And I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know. And so I, I write about authoritatively where I live, where I am usually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, and I also notice that, you know, if you're African and then, you're an African travel writer, it's almost like you're not seen with as much respect as if you're a travel, an African travel writer who went back home to Africa to write about mm -hmm. travel in Africa. Yeah. So I really don't understand why, you know, uh, why that. But uh, yeah, so that's one of the things that's really interesting, just watching a, 
Africans in the diaspora versus going back home and writing about my travels in, you know, Nigeria or Uganda or somewhere else. So yeah. it's, it's really interesting. It's, it's, an, it's an interesting thing. And I, and I, I, my, my vision is to, is to, is to find a way to change that because I think, I think the way I think of it is, okay, an American can leave America and go and write with authority about a place like Kenya, Uganda, Exactly. Congo. Um, but an African's voice is not authentic if they talk about somewhere else outside of Africa. I, exactly. I don't understand why. So we have to change it. Oh, yeah. Um, and and I'm, I'm definitely changing that narrative when it comes to Scandinavia and, uh, and Sweden because um, I also run a, a collective of travel, professional travel bloggers here in, in, uh, in the Nordics. Yeah. And I'm African, of, you know, of birth, you know, oh. and we focus. So it's... Um, I, I think the way the world is going now, I consider myself a citizen of, of the world. Yeah. Too much. With very strong Nigerian roots. Yeah. So. Perfect. So uh, before we finish, um, what, is, what is that one advice that you'll give to young Africans um, uh, who are trying to add value to, to wherever they are? I, I think adding value is, first of all, we need to redefine what success is to us mm -hmm. because um, different cultures define success differently. So, and, and I know from coming from Nigeria, success often means pr some kind of outward prestige of, you know, like the, the highest degrees or, you know, the biggest financial gains or, you know, or lawyer, you doctor, really, engineer. <laughs> exactly. Or, you know, making money or getting all the degrees and, and uh, being a gazillionaire, you know. <laughs> but uh, once, you, we, once we kind of collectively start redefining what success is, I think that would relieve the load off yeah. of a lot of Africans so that they can feel like, you know what, I am, I'm a poet and that's enough. Yeah. I'm happy. It makes me happy. Yeah. If being a poet makes me happy, then honestly, I feel successful. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I am happy. I'm getting to the point where I'm doing what I love. My authentic self is showing up. Yeah. And what we want, because Africans, I always say Africans, are, we are one of the most resourceful people on earth yes. while doing things we don't even want to do. <laughs> so imagine... <laughs> So, 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 so even when your parents force you to go be a doctor, <laughs> you come out still being a fa fabulous doctor, even exactly. if you don't want to be a doctor. So imagine if you actually did what you wanted to do. Yes. <laughs> I mean, if, I, if there were like, if I had 10,000 Africans, right? Yes. Saying all of you just do, just not disrespect your parents, sorry, but just say, dad, mom, this is what I want to do. And then just doing that, imagine just, how much powerful and how much just kind of creativity and richness we can bring into the world that has nothing to do with financial gain. Yeah. So, so I don't know. I mean, that's, I think, um, so for anybody that really wants to do what they want to do, you know, I, I say you have this one life and you first dis define what success is to you. If you can live with one less car so that you can use that, you know, time on those resources to focus on what you really want to do, then do it. Um, because I think you'll be just a lot happier. That That's my own Absolutely. idealistic Absolutely. view of the world. So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So finally, finally, um, uh, our, you know, trademark question. If you had 10,000 Africans, Lala, at your disposal, yes. with expertise mm. in every field, what would you mm. do? Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> what we do? Well, first of all, we'll definitely take over the world. That's for sure. But uh, and and I think it kind of echoes back to what I was saying. It was just um, expertise in everything. Just making sure that that is what they really want to do. Be passionate mm -hmm. about. And then we're going to. I think the biggest thing will be to try and build a more inclusive world. So you know anything. So even if it's uh, if I'm a poet, I'm a writer, try to build something that's more inclusive, that makes people not feel like they have to, they can't be their their their, their full selves. Yeah. So I don't. I think if I had ten thousand Africans, I, I think the biggest thing would be before we be, build or create anything, first figure out if what they are doing is what they were truly meant to be doing. Yeah. So you know, I don't need an African who is a 
a, a fantastic programmer if that's not what they really want to do in life. <laughs> so, that, so, so I think that'll be the first thing is just figure out, yes, this is your expertise, but is this what you're, uh, you're really passionate about? Yeah. And then it will be more 10,000 Af- uh, 10, Africans who are actually passionate about what it is they're doing. So. <laughs> boom, boom. I love it. I love it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for coming out, Lala. Um, thank you for having me. Before I let you go, how can people find you and connect with you? Yes, so I am all over social media and uh, my blog is lolaakimade.com, so A-K-I-N-M-A-D-E. And uh, it's the same on most of the social media. And, you know, if you just uh, Google, I mean, not trying to <laughs> go find you just put Lola, you know, uh, Akimade or Lola Sweden, I- I'll show up. So, so it'll be easy to find me. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. Thank you, thank you for coming on, Lola. It's been amazing having you on. I've had a lot of fun. Uh, thank you. Uh, and a lot of great conversation, a lot of lessons. Uh, so thank you for coming on. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure to like and share this video. And if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure to hit the subscribe button below.